Hello. Thank you for joining us today for Live from PON. Today we welcome Max Bazerman, who will be speaking to us about his new book, Better, Not Perfect, A Realist Guide to Maximum Sustainable Goodness. My name is Susan Hackley. I am delighted to greet you on behalf of the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School. PON is a consortium program of Harvard, MIT, and Tufts universities. This talk will be recorded and it'll be posted on the PON website in a few days. We will also be able to share the PowerPoint slides with you. You come from all over the world and we are honored that you've chosen to spend this hour with us. There will be time during the session for discussion. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of, a screen, of your screen. If you have a comment, you can write it in chat. Thank you to Diane Long and Anna Chang for their help with this program today. Now I'm happy to introduce today's presenter. Max Bazerman is a professor at Harvard Business School and a member of the Program on Negotiations Executive Committee. He's a renowned scholar and has written and co-written many books, including The Power of Noticing, Judgment in Managerial Decision-Making, and Blind Spots. Max has done consulting, teaching, and lecturing in over 30 countries, and he's received many honors, including an honorary doctorate from the University of London and the Life Achievement Award from the Aspen Institute's Business and Society Program. We're so pleased to have him here today to share insights from his newest book. Welcome to Live from PON, Max Bazerman. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, thanks to, to, to you and to Anna Chang and Diane Long for creating the series and for inviting me. And Susan, thanks for all you do in leading the program on, on negotiation in a variety of wonderful and terrific ways. Um, so I'm just thrilled to, to be with this uh, PON audience um, to talk about uh, Better Not Perfect. And as many of you are aware, I, I've written some books before, um, but this book may capture the essence of how I think about the world uh, more than anything that I've ever written. So I, I, I'm delighted to be able to share this with you. Um, to provide a little bit of context, I'm gonna tell you two brief stories, one pretty old, um, but the two stories uh, jointly capture the essence of what I'm trying to accomplish in the book, uh, Better Not Perfect. In 1993, um, that summer I, uh, I became a vegetarian um, following my spouse, Marla, who became a vegetarian about three years earlier. And in the fall of 1993, I was uh, giving a talk at an, an environmentalism conference at uh, Northwestern. And I mentioned I was a vegetarian. And um, when, when it was time for questions, um, a gentleman introduced himself and mentioned he was also a vegetarian, but he ate fish. And in a quite, uh, in a moment of stupidity, um, in, in an attempt for, at humor, I said that would make you a fishitarian. And I went on and, um, and was trying to forget about the sort of the bad attempt at humor I had made. And after the talk, um, my sort of brilliant, knowledgeable, and my old mannered colleague, Doug Medine, came up to me and um, basically highlighted how stupid my comment was. And he basically said, um, if that person wants to label vegetarianism as including eating fish, far better to allow him to do that than to offend him and increase the likelihood that he's going to turn to beef in the not too distant future since he can't get the title vegetarian um, within the way he wants to live his life. And, and as soon as Doug said that, I was, I was completely in agreement with the criticism he was offering of, of my behavior. 25 years after that, um, I was invited to be interviewed at a conference um, on effective altruism at MIT. So this was um, in the spring of 2018. And I showed up at the conference and the speaker before me was somebody who I had never heard of before. His name is Bruce Friedrich, who, and he's the CEO of the Good Food Institute, gfi.org. And um, Bruce gave a talk that basically has changed the last two and a half years of my life. Um, 
Bruce in his talk basically highlighted a number of interesting features. One, he highlighted the fact that the percent growth of vegans and, and vegetarians has been um, very um, minimal in terms of growth over the last 20 years. So basically we're looking at a very small percent of society that um, follows veganism or vegetarianism. Um, but there's been a 20% year over year growth in, the, in, the, uh, in selling plant-based products. So while people aren't endorsing the complete notion of veganism in any way, um, there's a dramatic growth um, in the um, funding of, the uh, creation of, and the consuming of plant-based products, which is a dramatically effective way um, of reducing animal suffering. And Bruce basically uh, encouraged the audience that, that included a lot of vegans um, to stop trying the conversion, instead focus on how do we bring products to the market that will lead more and more people to consume more and more plant-based products. And I was struck by that vision in a number of ways. One, it appealed to me, um, but I was, it also appealed to me in terms of how Bruce was accepting of the way other people wanted to lead their life and basically figuring out how to create behavioral change that would create the solution that vegetarians and veganisms uh, and vegan uh, what, what vegetarians and, and vegans are trying to accomplish which is reducing animal suffering on this planet and for me um, these two episodes kind of highlight the, the notion of what does it mean to be effective in creating more good in the world and um, and if you're going to think about creating more good um, it's useful to clarify what you mean. And I'm certainly a fan of utilitarianism and I'll um, talk about the limits of it as well. Um, but for me, it provides a useful goal. And I think of utilitarianism very much in the way that negotiation scholars that are part of PON think of the negotiation process in terms of value creation. Only instead of creating more value for the two or six parties involved in the negotiation, utilitarianism tends to focus on how do you create the most good across all sentient beings or maximizing aggregate pleasure and minimizing aggregate pain. This means being efficient. To, in order to create the most good possible, we need to be efficient in the use of resources. It means making choices that are independent of our preferences that might be biased by who we are in society, our gender, our wealth, our nationality, or our, or, our, or our ethnicity. And it means valuing the equality of the interests of all and avoiding tribal behavior such as nationalism and in-group bias. And what I find intriguing, and certainly for myself, is that you look at this list and many people think that looks pretty good, but in fact, the more we think about our own behavior, the more we see ways in which our own behavior deviates from this plan of action in a variety of ways, many of which we would defend and continue, but others where we might decide that we're interested in some change in those behaviors. Now, this is a little bit abstract, so I'm going to um, move on, move to a problem that is captured um, the world of experimental philosophy, um, a problem that many of you have seen before, but, uh, but my version might be a little bit different. So I'll ask you to hang in there, even if you think you've seen this problem before. And this is a variation of a very famous problem called the trolley problem. And um, that person with a question mark above their head, I'd like you to imagine that that's you. And this trolley's coming down the track. And if you do nothing, it will be move, move to the left-hand side and um, kill those three people on the left-hand track in a quick and painless death. But you have the option of switching. And if you switch, then the train will move to the other track, saving the three, but one person would die instead. And many people, uh, the majority of people are in favor of switching on this problem, basically to get the three for one deal that's being offered. In contrast, 
um, on the footbridge problem, and now you'll notice there's five people on the track instead of three, what your option consists of is turning a switch and that guy who's standing on the bridge will fall through, um, the, the floor will open, he will fall, he will get hit by the trolley, become what's technically called a trolley stopper, and the five people will be saved. And now all of a sudden, a lot of people want to violate the tenets of utilitarianism because this thing seems wrong. Either you don't, you know, sort of there's an ooh factor or you, you want to call this murder even though you're in trolley land where there is no um, penalty for your action in this particular context. Um, but people don't like this particular action and they're moving away from utilitarianism because of the nature of the method of creating the five for one deal. Um, but intriguingly, um, in another version of the problem, um, where there are two different trains coming down two different tracks, and you can turn the switch on the left to get a three for one deal, or you can turn the switch on the right to get the five for one deal, but you can't do both. In this two train problem, people now move towards switching on the right. They're much more likely to drop the guy from the bridge rather than to um, save the three people um, on the left. And this is a result of a tool that we've developed um, that basically shows that when you give people comparative options, they tend to be more deliberative. They tend to make better decisions. And in the ethical world, they create more value, okay? They're more likely to act in utilitarian ways. So utilitarianism consists of these particular attributes, and we can see it play out in a variety of ways. And what we're interested in is how would we encourage behavior to get, to create more value? And when I think about the world of negotiation that many of you are in, um, we often make a distinction between normative theory or what rational people um, should do in comparison to descriptive theory or how people actually behave. And a lot of what goes on at the program on negotiation is to think about how would we prescribe actions that would lead to better behavior. Better, even if you can't be perfect. In negotiations, we want people to create the biggest pie possible. In decision making, we want people to, to rationally accomplish whatever they want to accomplish. And in ethics, we want to create as much value as we can across all sentient beings, at least from a utilitarian perspective. So I want to um, uh, show you the, the footbridge problem again. And, um, and, and I want to introduce a, a sort of a intervention that might affect how you would think about whether or not you want to drop this guy or not. Again, you're in trolley land, there's no penalties. Um, he would die a quick and painless death. Um, if you drop them and you save the five and you can't, you can't jump in there yourself and all, lots of other things that you might want to do aren't available. Um, the question is drop or not. And I want to introduce a um, former Harvard uh, professor by the name of John Rawls, perhaps the most famous philosopher of the second half of the 20th century. And John Rawls was known for a number of things, but, but among the famous concepts that he was known for was the veil of ignorance. And the veil of ignorance encouraged, encouraged us to think about what we would want as the way society should operate if we didn't know who we were, if we didn't know what country we were from, if we didn't know our gender, if we didn't know our wealth, et cetera. And Rawls argues that if we could get ourselves into a mindset of disassociating from these demographic identities that we would pick more ethical decisions as a result. And what I wanna do now is apply roles to the footbridge problem. And the way this works is before you get to be the guy with the question mark on your head, I want you to imagine that you're one of six people. There's a one six chance you're the guy on the bridge and there's a five-sixth chance you're one of the five people on the track. 
And it, what I want you to do is simply think, what would you want the decision maker to do to switch or not? Now, an awful lot of people based on self-interest um, would like the switcher to switch um, in order to reduce, to, to improve the probability of surviving from 17% to 83%. So what we do is that um, we have some people think through the footbridge problem without going through the veil of ignorance thought exercise. We simply ask, um, do you dr drop or not as the per person with the switch? But for another group of people, we first have them go through the one six, five, six logic, and then we ask them what they should do or what they think is fair. And now all of a sudden, switching becomes much more popular. The veil of ignorance seems to increase our tendency to create the most value that we can. Now, some of the, some of the people listening might be getting a little bit tired of trolleys, um, so let's move to COVID, which is a contemporary um, problem that comes with a whole series of ethical dilemmas. And one that you probably read about in the newspaper had to do with the allocation of scarce resources. So who should get scarce resources? And rather than having you think about a complete formal policy that a healthcare institution or a state or a country might use, um, I'm going to make it simple for you. Should a hospital, should a hospital's only remaining ventilator be given to a 65-year-old patient who arrives at the hospital first? And I don't mean to bias you, but I am 65. Um, this would be a first-come, first-serve policy. Or should the ventilator be given to a 25-year-old patient who arrived moments later, which would save more life years? And for this problem, I want you to assume that the patient that gets the ventilator lives, the patient who doesn't get the ventilator, unfortunately, will pass away. And I want you to think through who should get it, the 65-year-old or the 25-year-old. And um, we've already collected this uh, the data on this problem. So I'll share with you that, that we see an egocentric pattern um, on the COVID dilemma. Um, we see that young people seem to think the young person should get it. And those of us who are 60 and older um, tend to want to give it to the older person. Again, this is nothing new to negotiation scholars. We see self-serving biases in lots of different contexts. But we then tried a version where we added the Rawls veil of ignorance, where we had people think that they could be the 25-year-old or they could be the 65-year-old with equal probability and ask them if that was the case, you had a 50% chance of being either of these two people, what would you want? And they want the 25-year-old to get it because they'd rather um, improve their uh, life by 60 years than improve life by 20 years for the 65-year-old. But then we ask them sort of what would be fair. And now all of a sudden, we see much more value creating decision making where the uh, folks who are 60 and older be basically make what we think is the more value creating decision by moving the ventilator um, to the 25 year old. So we're creating more life years rather than more um, people who are alive. Um, and that's certainly part of what a lot of people think of as in terms, in terms of utilitarianism. We also hear about quality adjusted life years as the metric that's commonly used as well. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move away from these two problems, uh, the trolley land problem and the COVID problem. And I wanna talk about what are some of the things that we could do that might allow us to create more value in society. Um, so I'm gonna assume that people who are listening to this talk are creating a, a great deal of, of value in society. I'm going to assume that um, we have very good ethical people, um, but I wanna to suggest to you that as I went on this journey of thinking through the content of this book, I could see lots of ways that I could do better that I could create more value in life. Um, um, and I wanna talk about some of the things that we could do. And one thing we could do is to deliberate 
um, more than using our intuition. Um, some of you um, are familiar with the book um, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, who very much advocates um, trusting your intuition a great deal. Um, most of us in the behavioral decision research world, behavioral economics negotiations world, we, we think that preparing, being more thoughtful, being more deliberative, being more analytical, analytic, um, improves outcomes a great deal. I think that the same is true in the world of ethics. To the extent that we deliberate more, and I showed you two things that lead, led people to deliberate, both the veil of ignorance, but also looking at comparative choice rather than individual choice, deliberation not only leads to better decisions, it leads to more ethical decisions. Another thing that we can do better is to focus on value creation as a mode of life. Um, in the negotiations literature, um, many, uh, many of you have seen a chart that looks something like this, where the value that where one axis has the value to you, and typically you see on the other axis the value to the other party in negotiations. And a lot of our effort is in teaching people how to avoid getting a result at outcome A instead of and, and, and instead negotiating between D, E, and F as viable solutions to problems. So this chart will look very familiar to anybody who's taken a negotiation class at PON, um, I'm quite sure. Um, and what I'm interested in is changing the axis from value to the other party at the negotiation table to value to all others that are out there in the world. And I think just like in negotiations where we show that finding wise trade-offs can allow us to move from point A to point uh, D, E, or F. I think that there are lots of ways in which smarter, more deliberative actions can allow us to create more value for others while also leading a better life for ourselves. Um, we might wanna even go farther down the curve to the Northeast so that you're willing to sacrifice your own value to create more value for others. But even without doing so, wiser courses of action are allow, will allow you to get to D, E, and F. And I'll be describing these over the next 20 minutes as well. Um, finally, um, I think it's useful for all of us to think about where we do a good job of improving pleasure and where we do a good job of reducing pain, but also where we don't. And um, I, I, I'm inspired by this very old cartoon of Andrew Carnegie, um, who gets lots of credit for his wonderful philanthropy. Um, and you've, you've seen the name Carnegie on lots of institutions as a result, but he also deserved a lot of blame for the pain that he created by the way in which he managed the steel mill and homestead where many people died, many people lost their jobs as a result of his very unethical and probably illegal actions that he took as the owner of the mill. I think if, if you want a contemporary version, um, I think the Sackler, Sackler family easily fits into the same pattern where they've created amazing value to society based on their philanthropy, but they also created amazing harm by marketing, and many people would argue mismarketing, um, um, the use of opioids to so many people, uh, creating dramatic harm to, 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 to others. All right, so the first three things that you see on this list, which I've just talked about, have to do with kind of modes of thought. Okay. Um, I think that we can deliberate more. We can focus on how do we create value in, in society um, by making wise decisions. Um, we can think about the various things we do, domains where we're very effective in being as ethical as we could be, creating as, as, as much value as we could. But we can also look for opportunities where perhaps we're not doing as much good as we possibly can. And I want to talk about this 
um, in four different kind of applied domains. Um, Susan mentioned my book, The Power of Noticing, which I, I published six years ago. And um, The Power of Noticing highlights the fact that there, are, there will continue to be people who do bad things. Um, and when a bad event occurs, whether it's Bernie Madoff or Volkswagen's actions in terms of um, polluting, uh, polluting the air, um, or um, Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos, what's, what's striking about the evildoers is that they're always surrounded by dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of people who have the ability to notice and act early to stop the harm from exacerbating. But so often we don't bother to notice and we allow that harm to continue. Um, and, and there are just lots of examples of that. So um, in terms of sort of being good and bad at the same time, I think Amazon is an interesting example of that because a lot of us really like the services that we get from Amazon but they do an awful lot of bad things as well. And I think about um, the way in which they created, um, they created competition for their H2 headquarters where they had over 200 different municipalities spending millions of dollars a piece to bid for the H2 headquarters, their second headquarters essentially. And it's just abundantly clear that Amazon could have shrunk the list to a much smaller group, a half a dozen, maybe a dozen, and save the resources from 200 other municipalities who wasted resources. And I think we should speak out on that. And I think we should notice that Amazon was involved in creating waste. And when we create waste in society, there are less resources to go around. So both noticing, reducing waste are two different domains where we see Amazon's activities where I think we could do, do much more effect, uh, where we can be much more effective. Um, perhaps the, um, the most novel chapter in um, Better Not Perfect is the chapter on time. And by novel, um, what I, I would, I, I'm really thinking about the work of uh, Peter Singer, um, uh, Moral Tribes by my Harvard colleague, Joshua Green, uh, two books that are, uh, two authors who are dramatically in sync with m much of what I write. And I've borrowed from both of these um, excellent scholars um, throughout the book. Um, uh, in this book, there's much more on the use of time than you might find in most work on either utilitarianism or effective altruism, a topic that I'm going to get to in a few minutes. So I think that we can think about how to use our time more wisely. And in fact, there's a, um, there's a not-for-profit called 80,000 Hours. Um, 80,000 Hours is part of the effective altruism movement. And um, 80,000 Hours provides young people with career advice on how they can create the most good possible based on their career selection. And I think that's a terrific um, thing to do. So I think, I think that the mission of 80,000 Hours is excellent. But like many people listening, um, I'm, not really some, I'm not really at a career choice point. I'm going to continue on with my professorial life. Um, but the idea from 80,000 hours of using your time wisely, I think applies to lots of things that we do. And um, in, the, in Better Not Perfect, I, I talk about the story of uh, Linda Babcock and her colleague, colleagues at Carnegie Mellon who created a support group called Just Say No. Um, and Linda is a very talented teacher, researcher, administrator, and she's a very good citizen at Carnegie Mellon. And um, when you have those attributes, your school, your university is likely to call on you to provide a wide variety of services. Um, turns out if you're female, you'll be called on even more than if you're a male because universities want female representation um, for lots of good reasons. But the result is that Linda ended up with far more demands on her time than she could possibly say yes to. 
And if you think about your task as creating the most valuable po value possible with your very limited resource called time, the correct answer to some requests is to simply say no. And I think that this book provides the logic for why you might want to say no and not even feel bad about it because you're saving this resource to create more good in different ways. Um, 15 years ago for my 50th birthday, um, I gave myself a present. Um, I quit four editorial boards on the same day. Um, for the academics, you're, you're, you're well aware of the experience of reviewing papers for academic journals. For the non-academics, um, one of the things that academics do is we review e each other's papers as part of the, um, uh, the peer review process for journals. And by the time I was 50, I would say I had reviewed enough papers for one lifetime. It was one of the things I didn't enjoy in life. And when I did a review of life at age 50 to see how am I using my time, I realized that I not only didn't enjoy that process very much, but I also didn't think I was creating the most value. That I thought that there were lots of 25 to 30 year old scholars who would actually enjoy the pro being more involved in reviews, that they would pay more attention, they would probably do a better job. So I quit these four editorial boards so that I could review less papers, so that authors could get better reviews, and I could have my time available. And hopefully it wasn't just a selfish act, but also an opportunity um, to use my time in ways that could create even more value. Okay, and finally, I wanna talk about donating. Um, and there's certainly a significant connection between ethics and the world of philanthropy. Um, and the part of the philanthrop philanthropy movement that um, is closest to the utilitarian perspective that I overviewed earlier and, and offer throughout the book um, is a movement called effective altruism. And um, I mentioned that I was attending a conference on effective altruism when I ran into Bruce Friedrich's talk. Um, I didn't mention that uh, at the beginning of the talk that when I walked into that room at MIT, a room filled with about 300 people, there were very few people my age. Okay, I was 63 at the time. There were very few people over 30 years old in the entire audience. Effective altruism is a movement led by young people. It was created by Will McCaskill and Toby Ord um, uh, uh, slightly more than a decade ago, and at the time they were philosophy graduate students at Oxford. And the basic notion of the effective altruism uh, philanthropy world is that um, we can create more good to start with by donating more, that the poorest of the world um, need our resources more than we need um, some of our resources. Um, effective altruism is built around creating the most good that we can given the amount that we're willing to do donate. So we want to spend our money efficiently and effectively. Effective altruism believes in treating the interests of all equally. So that means that all people have the same interests in terms of reducing their suffering um, and improving their pleasure. Um, philanthropy tends to be more involved in reducing suffering, that we shouldn't discriminate against any specific groups. And effective altruists tend to also think in terms of um, the most quantifiable metrics that they could come up with. I, I mentioned the term quality before, that's quality adjusted life here. And a lot of effective altruism focuses on how do we create the, the most valuable possible by creating the most quality adjusted life years across all sentient beings. Okay, so um, this is a pretty um, tough to uh, read chart. So I'm gonna tell you about it. It's, uh, the chart is by Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers, uh, two terrific economists at the University of Michigan. And um, they basically address the notion um, that uh, that some people question, does money, more money make you happier? And there's a lot written that suggests that the answer is no, but most of that isn't particularly rigorous. Um, I think that Stevenson and Wolfers put together 
tremendous data that highlights that, um, that being wealthier does make you happier, but not that much. And they look at the question of what happens to people who have their wealth doubled. So you could think of Americans making either 50,000 or 100,000 or Americans making 100,000 or 200,000. And their interesting result is that doubling wealth creates a similar improvement in happiness for people across different societies across the world. So that means that if you happen to be living on $500 a year, you'll get the same jolt by going to 1,000 as someone making $250,000 will get from go, by going from 250,000 to 500,000. Obviously, this can't be a completely precise metric, but it's certainly an interesting idea. And Will McCaskill, the young philosopher at Oxford who created the effective altruism movement, highlights that if you, if this resonates with you at all, it would highlight that your philanthropy should go to the very poorest in the world because the very poorest in the world are going to get more benefit by your marginal dollar than people who are better off. And as, as a result, um, a lot of the recommendations from the effective altruism movement, for example, at givewell.org, um, highlight the benefits of sending money to the very, very poorest people in the world. Also on the list of effective al altruists um, tends to be um, giving money to, re to reduce animal suffering, particularly on factory farms. And again, I'm convinced by the arguments that the effective altruists make that if you want to reduce suffering, that's a shockingly good place to do it. Um, many, of, many of you who know me know that I love my dog, Becca, um, tremendously. She's a wonderful dog. Um, but the effective altruists highlight that most of us, even when we donate to animal charities, we think about dogs and cats. Um, uh, and there's far more that can be done in terms of making the world better if you believe in equality for all by dealing with the suffering that exists on factory farms. And finally, future generations get attention from effective altruists as well. Now, um, I'm confident that there's some people out there um, who um, don't like some of what I've been saying about effective altruism. Uh, effective altruism is a hot topic. Um, where young techies tend to find it intriguing and traditional philanthropists do not, partially because traditional philanthropists have spent many years and many, a lot of resources donating to organizations that aren't viewed as effective by the effective altruism movement. Um, but I would also highlight the title of my book, um, Better Not Perfect. And the idea of Better Not Perfect is that we can't get to perfectionism. We can't get to perfect utilitarianism. And I see utilitarianism as a goal, kind of like rationality or um, the Pareto efficient frontier that we can't get to, but we can be better at it. And there are other ways to do it. So um, some of you know my spouse, Marla, and she's really good at being better. Um, and she does it without agreeing with the effect of altruism movement um, to, a, to a particularly strong degree. She understands it, um, but she focuses a lot of her attention on um, social services and uh, Boston um, area. Marla does agree with the effective altruism movement by getting people to donate more. Okay? Um, but she focuses on how to do that by making donating more enjoyable, by focusing on the connectivity, by creating, uh, by creating a philanthropic organization that emphasizes social connection, by using our living room in non-COVID times to fill the room with 80 or 100 people to introduce them to ways in which they could be better that by knowing an organization, by resonating with an organization, and as a result of the activities in our living room, I think Marla does a terrific job of making the world better without necessarily um, agreeing to the perfectionist standards of utilitarianism um, or effective altruism. 
So I'm going to close with this slide, and then um, we're going to be open to some um, some questions, which um, I, I think you can submit online through the chat function. Um, what better not perfect um, suggests is that we can I, we can develop a goal of identifying what's a sustainable level of goodness and how could we get there. I, I'll, I'll, I'll clearly tell you in the process of writing this book, I've been able to identify a wide variety of ways in which I can change my behavior, lead a completely wonderful life, and yet do more good in the world. And part of this undoubtedly means donate more, but I think we can also donate more effectively. Um, by deliberating more about your decisions and actions and your giving behavior, um, you can create more value. Um, in some, even if you don't like some of the terms that I've been talking about, utilitarianism, effective altruism, if you were to endorse the notion of auditing life and identifying ways in which we could be better rather than perfect, then I think that the book could uh, will have served its purpose. Thank you for spending the, the last 40 minutes um, listening to me. And uh, now I look forward to um, hearing um, what, what you might have to offer in terms of critiques, comments, or questions. Well, Max, that was very interesting and um, illuminating. So we have many questions and they, um, they scan the whole, um, all the topics of your talk. And I will start with <clears throat> the first early on opening statements about vegetarianism um, from Andrew Stawaz. He says, thank you so much. On your opening anecdote about vegetarianism and fishitarianism, does it matter if, for the sake of argument, but it is plausible, eating fish causes far more harm to animal welfare than eating, say, pork or beef? More animals killed per calorie and more suffering during the death and often during life too, on average. Isn't there some value in pointing, pointing that out in some situations to someone who is ostensibly concerned about the goal of minimizing animal suffering through his diet? Um, so thank you for, for, for the question. Um, so um, I, I, I don't claim to be an expert biologist in, in assessing the suffering of different species. So I, I saw I have a hard time answering the quantitative a part of that question. Um, what, what, what I, by the way, when I, when I um, insulted the person by calling him a fishitarian, I, I knew the word pescatarian, um, but I was simply trying to be funny. Um, but to, to the current question, um, um, I think that different people are going to come up uh, come out different places um, between fish and beef on what's causing more harm to the environment. Um, I think that there's more environmentalists who would focus on beef and certainly the people who think about the quality adjusted experience of all animals um, see um, chickens as cr having more total suffering than either fish or beef. So, uh, so we can add in different species, but quite honestly, um, I, I, that's outside my turf, and um, and I don't want to create judgment for uh, on any uh, fish eaters or beef eaters or chicken eaters or cheese eaters for the um, for the vegans out there. Um, I, I want to suggest that all of us can probably think about ways in which we can create a better world by adjusting our in ways that would allow us to eat phenomenal food um, and to be healthier in the process. And that's a, an overall, um, that's a, a pretty good pa package overall. Um, I'll note that when Marla became a vegetarian, um, the quality of food in my household went up dramatically. She spent more time thinking about the creation of food um, when she was a vegetarian than when she was a carnivore. Um, so I think that there's a lot of women's available, but I don't want to make the judgment calls between different strategies that different people might be willing to pursue. All right. Um, moving on to another one of the topics that you covered. Um, Camilla Novak asks the question, and this is about the um, choosing between um, a 25-year-old versus a 65-year-old's life, okay? Sure. So 
Well, for the 25-year-old and the 65-year-old, let's just play with additional details. The 25-year-old is a junkie and thief, while the 65-year-old is a dedicated father, grandfather, and a beloved professor influencing dozens of lives. How about that? We need to have context to create value, do we not? Absolutely. So um, in any abstract problem, the goal is to hold everything else constant. It's kind of like a, um, an experiment. Um, a, you can imagine a clinical trial where we want to find out um, whether a drug works or not. So we randomly assign people to conditions. And we can't randomly assign people to be 25 um, or 65. So the problem is meant to not give you information about all those other attributes of the individual. And absolutely, they should be involved as well. It, and, and from a utilitarian perspective, we could imagine that that 65-year-old um, is a healthcare worker who can help solve the COVID crisis. Um, yeah, we want to get that 65-year-old healthy so that, um, so that she can do more good as well. Um, so I completely agree with the essence of the question. Um, in the real world, we want to consider more factors. The problem is it provides you no know, information on that. And the main point that I, that I wanted to highlight is that the veil of ignorance was a terrific tool for eliminating a bias where people simply wanted to save their own type um, rather than looking at it from a more objective perspective. So I would sort of focus on the fact that um, the 65-year-old may be this noble, helpful person um, in comparison to the 25-year-old. That exists under the veil of ignorance as it does in the original problem. So, uh, so I'm focusing on the shift that we're able to create through the veil of ignorance re reasoning. So we can now take any real comparison between the two people. We can add lots of facts. And I would argue it would be good to put on a veil before we make a decision between those two more complete people. So essentially what I'm doing is what any sort of um, pharmaceutical trial or social science experiment looks like, looks like by holding as my, many other things constant that we would certainly want to consider in any real world context. Thank you. Our next question is from Christine Johnson. My question is how to take a unitive view instead of a dichotomous one. How can both intuition and deliberation be complementary and not mutually exclusive? Sure. Um, so, so terrific question that has a long history of, of thought. Um, so I, I think that the, um, the question um, really catches me in oversimplifying the world. So I, I appreciate that part. Um, and I'll, I'll continue to assert that there's vast amounts of evidence saying deliberation wins over intuition both for better decisions and for more ethical decisions. And I'm sort of happy to develop that sort of offline um, with the person asking the question. Um, but her question reminds me of one of the founders of the program on negotiation and one of my intellectual heroes, um, Howard Rafa. Um, and um, there are many versions of this story. It's a, it's an old story, as you'll be able to tell in a, in a minute. Um, but, but before I tell you the story, I would highlight that Howard Rafa is very much of, uh, is very much someone who we admired for his analytic skills. And he certainly was a fan of deliberation. He wrote a, the book called The Art and Science of Negotiation, which was one of the founding books of the program on negotiation and the contemporary field of negotiation. He liked deliberation. But 25 years before he wrote the book, Art, The Art and Science of Negotiation, he was a young professor at Columbia. And by that point, he had already invented many decision analytic tools that we view as common today. And um, while on the faculty at Columbia, Harvard came along and made Howard an offer. Now, the, the following story doesn't happen to be true, um, but Rafa was always very positive about um, hearing the story. Um, and in the story, when Harvard makes him the offer and he doesn't know whether to stay at Columbia or move, move to Harvard, um, he goes to see his dean, who's also his friend. He describes the problem and asks his dean and his friend for advice. 
and this other person says to him, well, what you do is you put Harvard in one column and Columbia in the other column and you list a bunch of attributes and you weight the attributes, you rate Harvard and Columbia on each of the attributes and then you see which one has more points at the bottom. This is kind of the complete deliberative approach to this rather than saying, what do you feel like doing? And Rafa's hypocritical response was, no, but this is an important decision which highlights the fact that most of us like our intuition. And when I ask ex executives, if you had to make such a choice, would you follow the deliberative strategy of the analysis and the number at the bottom, or would you go with your intuition? And I will tell you executives like their intuition. But when Rafa reflected on the story that was often told about him that didn't happen to be true, he highlighted the fact that he would use his intuition in order to look at the deliberative score sheet and see if he was forgetting things that belonged in the deliberative system, whether emotion was leading him to misweight certain attributes. So he would allow the intuition to audit the, deliber the, the more deliberative system. And he would also use the more deliberative system to see why his intuition might be off. Notice that we are only concerned when deliberation and intuition come up with different answers. And his argument was basically for um, a mediation between these two processes so that intuition could help the more deliberative process. So those are two different answers. One is um, more opinionated in favor of deliberation. The other one is uh, a bit more uh, reconciliatory in terms of seeing some wisdom for our more intuitive systems. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Gina and Schulte. Going back to the trolley problem, but applicable in general to being better, not perfect, how does one help others break through decision paralysis or decision abdication? Yeah, so I, I, I think we want to make that as concrete as possible. So uh, th there are times when people don't want to make any decision at all and no decision is worse than, e than either course of action. And I think that we want to make the implications of paralysis um, clear to, to, to lots of people. So um, um, after I sort of endorse deliberation as much as I can, um, people sometimes ask, should I, should I always deliberate? And the answer is certainly not. If you deliberate over every choice that you make in a grocery store, that's this place that you used to visit to get food before COVID. Um, if you deliberate over every decision you make, you'll spend too many hours there and you want to see the implications of paralysis. So we want to deliberate on our important decisions. We want to deliberate on how we run our life, but we don't want to deliberate over every trivial decision we make in life. To do so would simply be a mistake because the cost of the deliberation exceeds the important of, importance of the decision that we're making. Excellent. Here's a question from Samuel Bletcher. How do you fit supporting or not supporting government redistrib redistribution of wealth? I see lots of people who like Carnegie and Bezos, among others, are very philanthropic, but fight tooth and nail against raising taxes to redistribute wealth. Shouldn't being better include supporting taxes to give more to the poorest? Yes. That, that's a simple answer. So yes, we should have a tax system that taxes the rich far more. Um, I think taxing wealth is a fine thing to do. Um, we have to figure out how to do it in a, in a way that actually works and, and there are a variety of challenges there. But uh, redistributing wealth um, is certainly on the path toward being better if where the where the goal is to create as much value as you can. Notice if you move money from rich to poor, um, you haven't increased the number of dollars, but you have increased value because an extra thousand dollars means a lot more to the poor than it means to the rich. So um, utilitarianism um, would strongly endorse um, moving more money from the rich to the poor. And um, I'm certainly, um, I, 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 I follow the same logic 
as both a person asking the question and utilitarianism. Um, so I think in terms of the criticisms of specific philanthropists, whether it's Carnegie or Bezos, um, I think that we see one more paradox of how there are people who do a great deal of good, but they also create harm um, by, um, by lobbying for um, favorable tax systems that benefit the rich, which um, certainly is a value destroying move. Thank you. Andrew Patterson asks, any prescriptive suggestions on how to manage negotiations so that the other party genuinely believes your attempts at effective altruism? This rather than being perceived as weak and or naive. Sure. So, uh, so I, I think that we could identify lots of ways um, in terms of the um, diagram I provided in terms of you versus all others that, that would match onto you versus the other in negotiations. And I think, in, I think we would get a lot of insight from the negotiations world where we focus on how do you create value in a world where you might also care about who gets how much of that value. Um, so that's not purely utilitarian, but you are being better when you create more value and get out to the Pareto efficient frontier, even if you continue to be concerned about your own outcome. So, so much of the negotiations literature focuses on exactly this question. Um, and part of the answer is by asking more questions to learn from the other side. And that could either be the other side in the negotiation or other people who are very different than you in society. Um, to the extent that you are willing to uh, reveal some information in negotiation, you affect the behavior of others. To, to the extent that you look for multiple alternative strategies to accomplish your goals, you're more likely to be effective. So I would look right at um, the world of negotiations for ideas on how we can create more value um, in, the wor in this world where there are other people um, who might not have the exact same interests as ours. A, a lot of the strategies that I would use, I, uh, I've written about with uh, Deepak Malhotra and Negotiation Genius, um, but there are lots of books um, that have been written by um, PON authors and others um, that deal, I think, explicitly with that topic. And I think we have question, time for one more question before we need to turn this back over to Susan. All right, we'll have one more, and this is from Katie Exum. With different viewpoints in the current violative, violative situations in the USA, and with this, the day of remembrance of 9-11, how can we as Americans learn how to be better with each other while we may not be perfect in our understanding of all viewpoints? Um, so I, I think that there's this, lots of ways that we could learn to to be better. So we've talked about philanthropy. We've learned. We've talked about speaking out. We've talked about reducing waste. We've we've uh, we've talked about deliberating more. So I think all these strategies move us in that in that direction. Um, but I, a, another clear way that we can move in the right direction is by electing a new president. Um, quite frankly, we're in a we're in a, a state of existence where, where we have a, a sitting president who's destroyed so much value um, by uh, denigrating a variety of groups within our country, by destroying trade relationships, by destroying our relationships with other countries. Um, all of these things um, move directly the opposite from better not perfect. So um, if, the, if there was one act that's important and, and certainly consistent with effective altruism, it's making Joe Biden the next president of the United States. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Susan to wrap us up. Hi. Um, Got to get myself on there. Max, thank you so much. It feels that your book is coming at such an important time. I hope everybody gets it, shares it. It's wonderful for those of us who know you and your wife, Marla, to see her recognized in this way. And thank you for all the things both of you do to make the world a better place. And thank you to all of you who tuned in today, who gave such wonderful questions and comments. Uh, I invite you to look at the PON website, lots of materials there, available reports, um, lots of books you can take a look at, uh, blog posts, all kinds of things to just continue learning. 
and we'll be having more events this fall. So we hope to see you at some of those. Uh, thank you, Anna and Diane. Thank you to all of you. Have a great day and evening. Bye. Thanks, everybody.